Well, yes, I'm a psych student, but I also study neuroscience, and that's the study of the brain. Um, I'm a giant nerd, and that's why I take something like this so seriously. Um, so we've seen a lot so far in these presentations of the whole social aspects of change, and I'm here more to talk about the biological aspects of change, how we actually change, and how we can see it in our biology. That's not good. There we go. So, when you think of the universe, I think of two words. I think of distance. The diameter of our known universe is about 26 <coughs> billion light years. And the amount of matter, which is my second word, that makes up this whole space is 10 to the power of 79, which means there's 10 followed by 79 zeros. That's how many elementary particles make up this space. And in this intergalactic playground, they come together and they make things like suns, planets, hopefully the Navi population on Pandora, if we're lucky. <laughs> and to me, as a kid, this was the most awe-inspiring thing I could think of. Until I came to university, and I learned about the human brain. And your human brain's a little bit bigger than this. I wanted to get a real one, but ethical, thing, ethical principles, I couldn't really bring it in. And what I learned about was that there's actually 100 billion neurons that make up this brain, and each one makes around 10,000 connections to other neurons. So when you do the math, the amount of potential communication networks in your brain is 10 to the power of 1 million, which means there's more potential communication networks in your brain than there are elementary particles in the universe. Something to think about, and something about the whole talk of my presentation. So I know everyone doesn't really have a basic understanding of neuroanatomy. I know in high school you don't even touch it. So quickly, the fundamental building blocks of the brain are neurons. They're made of three components. Dendrites take in information from other neurons. This information is processed in the cell body, and then it's sent out via the axon to other neurons. I also said the word connections. And this is exactly here. You see two neurons making connections with each other. And this is how they communicate. And this is what makes them so much different than other cells in your body, is they can talk to each other. And these simple neurons link together to make simple circuits. And simple circuits govern simple behaviors. For example, you take a paralyzed cat, put it in this apparatus here, and turn on the treadmill. Even though it's paralyzed, it starts stepping. It's because it has these simple neural networks that control something as simple as just a stepping reflex. So what happens? when we start linking these simple circuits together. When we do that, we get modules. And modules are specific areas in your brain that their, their sole function is to process a certain kind of information. For example, Wernicke's area is involved in language comprehension. It has a whole bunch of simple circuits that help you understand words. So what happens when we start linking these modules together? When you link modules together, then you get systems. For example, language system. So again, information comes in, you hear something, for example, your name. You comprehend it in Wernicke's area. Then you think about what you want to say back. So you send this information to Broca's area. Broca's area has a whole bunch of motor programs for every speech sound that you've, kept, that you've heard. Then it sends this information to your tongue and your larynx and you produce the word you want to say. So just as physicists study gravity by dropping an apple, and a meteorologist studies the wind by watching the way it blows around a flag. As neuroscientists, we study the brain via behavior. And we know when there's certain areas damaged, then we know this area is involved in certain behaviors, and we can see this. So just again to run through, because this is important to know, neurons are the basic building blocks of the brain. They form together to make simple circuits. These <coughs> circuits compound together to make modules, and modules connect to make systems. So what I'm here today to talk to you about is experience-dependent plasticity. And this phenomena is this. For the longest time, and up to very recently, it was believed that if you took an adult brain and took a snapshot today, and a snapshot 10, 20, 50 years down the road, the brain would be the exact same, no differences. But the belief and the understanding now is, actually, if I were to take a snapshot of my brain now, and then have a couple of learning experiences, and then I take a snapshot 10, five days down the road, doesn't matter, there are actually rewiring that's going on in your brain, and it changes. And that's this whole phenomenon. So this was studied by a guy named Hebb around 50 years ago. He took two groups of rats. He took a group of rats and left it at his lab back at McGill. And he took another group of rats and let them grow up in his kitchen. 
and he found that the rats that grew up in his kitchen had many more experiences they had to deal with, like jumping over knives, running through the sinks. And he found when he took these two groups of rats and ran them through a maze, the ones that grew up in his kitchen were much better at navigating the maze, and they also had much more complex neurons because they had to deal with these much more complex environment. You, for on the human level, we can study plasticity by looking at musicians, for example. If you take a left-handed guitar player and you look at the two cortical representations of their right and left hand, the left hand is much more active, making different shapes to play chords, running through scales, soloing. And when you see, the left-handed representation is much bigger than the right hand representation, which is just doing basic strumming. We even see fundamental differences in athletes because they perform different behaviors. They're specialized in their own specific ways. There's differences between what a basketball player does and a difference between what an archer does. And we see these fundamental differences. So it basically comes down, no matter what you're doing, riding a unicycle, typing on a computer, hammering a nail, everything we're doing is changing our brain some way. I'm not here to say don't do drugs. Everyone's heard that enough. What they do know is if you pre-treat rats for two weeks with amphetamine or cocaine, and then you put them in this enriched experience, the expected plasticity doesn't occur. So somehow, these kind of drugs are actually affecting your ability to learn. That's very important, especially for this slide. So this slide shows a diagram of a, of a developing brain from five to 20 years old. The red and yellow areas are much thicker brain, and the blue and purple are thinner. What this means is you're born with an overabundance of neurons, and then as you learn and experience through the world, they get linked into circuits. Neurons that aren't getting linked into circuits get booted out because they have no use. So I'll raise a hand for everybody here who's under 20 years of age. Good, lots of people, good. Well, what this means for you underneath 20, did you put up your hand? Good. He's 60, he should be putting up his hand. What this means for people, who are under 20 is that your brain is much more plastic than my brain or anyone else's brain who's over 20 because it's still developing. So even though I can still change and my grandmother can still change her brain, not as efficiently as you can. It's like you are still in this time where your brain is highly plastic because you can learn so much easier than we can. It's this whole phenomenon of critical periods. So I want you to think of your brain in a certain way. Think of your body as analogous to your entire brain, and each muscle on your body is analogous to modules that make up your brain. And just as I can go to the gym and lift weights and get buff, I can do the exact same thing with my modules. By enriching the experiences that control these modules, these areas get bigger and they become more, they become better at processing more complex information. And that's what you really want to do, is you want to work out your brain and get it stronger. So what I plan on doing with all this information in the future is three things. Because I'm a scientist, we like to build and work as a community. So the first thing I'd like to do is show that actually plasticity was one of the driving forces behind human evolution. And that's why we have this complex brain that has so many modules that gives us all this diverse behaviors that we have. The second thing I'd like to show is that a brain that's challenging itself to constantly rewire and constantly change actually becomes better at it. And in that sense, again, can process more cons complex information. This is important for society because we want to better ourselves so that society gets better. The third thing I'd like to do is to apply this phenomenon of plasticity towards neurological and mental disorders. Now, I don't think we can fix all these disorders, but what I do want to do is somehow apply this power of plasticity to a more holistic approach to therapy and treatment as opposed to the drug approach that we have now because it has so many negative side effects. So who am I and what do I plan on doing? I'm an agent of change. I want to take and I want to be on the train of the paradigm shift that takes the focus away from our complexity of our universe and actually put it in between and focus on the organ that sits between our ears. And just as you sit outside on a starry night and you look at the stars and you look at the blackness, you think, wow, it's so awe-inspiring. The stars are so far away, it's so complex, it's so infinite. What this actually is, just a reflection of the potential that we have in our brains and what we can do. And I want people to understand this and I want people to work out their brains and become better individuals. Thank you.